Psalm 46 is where we will be this morning. Um, and here, here's, here's what I want to do. I want to go ahead and read through Psalm 46 uh, to begin with. And uh, then we'll start to break it down a little bit, uh, introduce it, the subject matter this morning, and start to break it down. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains um, tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Psalm 46, I've come to, to absolutely just adore this psalm. There are several that I like. Um, but this psalm really is a source of encouragement and strength for me. You know, especially when we start talking about dark times. And, you know, today, as you well know, uh, you couldn't have gone this week without knowing this. But today, as you well know, is the 10th anniversary of 9-11. Um, when our nation was changed forever um, uh, because of the things that uh, have taken place since then or the, the things that took place on that day. And all across the nation, this afternoon, uh, Sunset is uh, having a tribute to uh, civil servants and, and just a remembrance of those who lost their lives on, on that day. Last night, I heard, I've heard several people say that they attended the, the uh, Civic Center uh, the, the Second Church of Christ uh, hosted a uh, memorial uh, yesterday evening. Heard that it was wonderful. Um, and so all across the nation we're remembering. Um, and, and, and I don't want you to, to think that I'm trying to take away at all from uh, the tragedy of that day or uh, that in, in any way that I'm, I'm taken away from that. But one of the things that happens when I begin to think of, about 9-11 is I, I, think of, I think of some of the promises in Scripture, some of the truths from Scripture. And again, I'm not trying to minimize what happened on that day. So, so don't hear me. It, it's just that I'm trying, I'm kind of a realist. And the Bible says, Jesus says in the Bible that um, that in this life there will be many troubles. In, in this life there will be many trials. In, in fact, the writer of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, put it a little bit different way. He said that in this life there's a season for every activity. There's a time to be born and a time to die. There's a time to plant and a time to uproot. There's a time for war and a time for peace. And, and, and so again, making sure that you understand, I'm not trying to minimize the events 10 years ago or, or say that we should ever forget because I agree with the, the video that, we, we shown, that we've shown this morning that we should never forget. We should never forget the sacrifices that have been made. Those who have fought for the freedoms of this nation. We should never ever forget and yet when we start talking about dealing with dark times it's it's not just about those events Solomon says that dark days come upon all of us they fall upon each and every one of us in fact James we just came through that book of James James makes this statement he says don't be surprised my dear brothers when you suffer trials of many kinds um, because as followers of Jesus Christ, 
honestly, as human beings, we are going to face trials. And so sometimes that darkness comes in the form of, of a diagnosis. You've just received a cancer diagnosis or maybe someone has been diagnosed with AIDS or, or, or maybe that darkness comes because of something that, that you have done. Uh, you know, some, some way that you've treated another individual and so you're having to deal with, uh, with, with darkness or, or, or some sort of trial and heartache. Um, it, a lot of different reasons. Tragedy. Maybe it's the death of a loved one that you've suffered recently and so you're facing very difficult days. So how is it that we go on? How is it that we continue to um, walk with, with hope? As the video proclaimed, that you know, we remember 10 years ago, but there's a hope. There's a faith. And there's love for our human race. How do we continue? How do we go on? Well, I think the very first thing that the psalmist in Psalm 46 points out is that we must first shift our focus. We have to shift our focus. There in verse 1, and it's not just in verse 1, but it's also verse 7 and verse 11, so if you want to kind of jump to those as we look at it again, the psalmist writes and says, God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Notice that in, in, as he's facing some sort of hardship, we don't really know what it is. He goes on to lay out some of it, even though the earth tremble and the mountains fall into the sea. No matter what happens, God is our help. God is our refuge. He is our strength. A very present help in time of trouble. And so and notice that what he does is he puts his focus upon God, the creator. First and foremost, he goes there. In verse 7, he, he says, verse 7, he says, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Once again, he's reminding himself that, that God is our refuge. He's our tower. He's our strength. And verse 11 reads much the same way. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So how do we do that? How do we get our eyes off of the trial and put our eyes back on God? Well, there's an old, old song that we used to sing, and I know sometimes, and that, that kind of drives me crazy too when we use a song to, to make a point with the illustration, but it really is true. Um, all through Scripture, what we are taught to do is to get our eyes off of here and to place our eyes upon God. To place our eyes on eternity. To, to not so much worry about the, the, the temporal, but to start to focus upon eternity and what that looks like. The old song, by the way, is um, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. I love that song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. I, I like that phrase. It will grow strangely dim. And, and the reason I like it so much is because it kind of describes the mystery that really does happen. I don't know exactly how it takes place. I, I'm, not so, I'm not so sure why that happens, but what, what the song explains, much like what Scripture explains, is if we will simply place our eyes upon God and, and put our focus upon Him and get our focus away from the problem and the trial, that it'll grow strangely dim. It's mysterious. It's, it's almost magical in the way that it takes place if we'll just simply focus on God and what He wants. All of a sudden, our troubles don't look so, so difficult because we focused upon our Creator. It's kind of like this. I remember when I was a kid, some of you probably went through the same thing. I was a pretty honorary kid. And, um, and, and I like to play hooky. Okay? Anybody else? Come on, you can tell the truth. I, I love to play hooky. Um, in fact, sometimes there were times I even snuck out at noontime. I would hide down in this, this, well, uh, this uh, stairwell by the school until everybody had gone in at playtime and then I'd go home. 
you know. And but but sometimes I would get up in the morning and I wouldn't want to go. And so I would say to my mom, I don't feel good. My stomach hurts. You know? And and, and some of you probably are way ahead of me because this is kind of this has become kind of a you know, a traditional answer. But it, it was this way in our house. I would say, my stomach hurts. I don't feel good. I feel sick. And, and mom would always, she would follow up with this, well, then throw up. <laughs> you know, we were going to prove to her that we were sick. If we were staying home, we were going to throw up. I mean, sometimes she'd take your temperature, you know. I would hate to tell you that sometimes we even put it by the light bulb. Uh, and, and so, but, but th this is true. She would say, then throw up. And, and so sometimes, this I know this is really disgusting, but I would go in just and I was so stubborn, I would go in in order to actually stay home, I would go in, stick my finger down my throat, and I would throw up. But when I did, this is what followed. Now don't you feel better? <laughs> am, am I lying? Hey, am I making that up? That was her answer. That was her answer. Now, don't you feel better? Now, here's, here's what I've learned through the years, especially dealing with issues like depression and, and just grief and different things. What I have learned is that there's a little bit of truth to that. I mean, sometimes if you'll just get up and you'll get focused on something else rather than the issue, rather than the problem, rather than the day that you're facing, it's so much better. Amen? Amen. And that's exactly what the psalmist tells us. If we'll just focus our, our attention on God, then the stuff of earth starts to grow really dim. We don't know how it happens, but it does. One of my favorite illustrations, I was talking to Bob Cassidy about this a couple of weeks ago. One of my favorite illustrations from the Bible, or stories, I should say, is the story of Elisha and his servant. Now, not Elijah. Elijah is the one that fought the prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth. And when he fought them, uh, victorious and then Jezebel threatens him and he goes out and sits under a broom tree and when he sits down under the broom tree he says God I'm done I'm, I'm done I've had it get somebody else. and so God, God says okay I'll get somebody else I'm going to replace you and your replacement is Elisha and so Elisha comes on the scene and Elisha does all the, I mean really all the same things that Elijah was doing the miracles and and just the, the works of God within his life. And Elisha used to tell Israel how to avoid some of the nations around them. Like in war. And so one particular army decided they didn't, they didn't care for Elijah, or Elisha a whole lot. And so they came to basically intimidate him. Or even to kill him. And so they're, they're around his tent. They surrounded his tent. Elisha's inside. Now he could be asleep. I don't know. He could be uh, just, you know, inside taking care of the things that he needs to. But his servant is outside, and his servant looks up and he sees that they're surrounded by this army. And he goes in and he says, "Elisha." My interpretation is that he goes in and says, "This, Elisha, you are in trouble. Not we." Now, he, does, he actually does say we. But, but he goes in and he says, Elisha, we're in trouble. They've got us surrounded out here. It does not look good for us. And Elisha says, I don't know what you're talking about because there are more for us than there are against us. The servant's kind of like, are you? Are you dreaming? And so he's, Elisha, the scriptures say that Elisha begins to pray. And what he prays is the eyes of his servant will be open. And as they were, the servant went back out and he looked. And all around the city and all around the mountains were angels sitting on chariots of fire. Folks, the psalmist tells us that our confidence, our focus can be upon God, our creator, our provider. He's the one who's created it all. It doesn't make any difference what circumstances that you're in. He has created it. And He is in control. And so we put our focus back on Him. I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Almighty, the Maker 
of heaven, the creator of all the earth. And so we get our, our eyes off of the issue and back on God. By the way, just a little side note. You want to know the secret to turning our nation around again? It's as a people if we get our eyes back on God. Amen. Nothing else. No political party. No president. No governor. And by the way, our president and our governor, and if you take this as a criticism of them, I pray for them. I'm taught, the scriptures teach us that as Christians we are to pray for them. But I will still be critical of them. They need to get their eyes back on God. And not upon some human way of reducing this debt. We just simply need to put our eyes back on Him. And, and that's the key to changing, turning things around. Is to get our focus right. Secondly, I think the psalmist points out. That we need to realize God's presence. We must realize God's presence. Look at verses 4 and 5. I'll come back to verses 2 and 3. But 4 and 5 he says, There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. There are so many times that when we're in the midst of heartache, or some sort of trial that it's like we feel all alone. I mean, I have experienced it enough to know that that's what takes place for each and every one of us. I mean, you're facing the death of, of someone that you love. Or maybe you're facing that bad news that came in. Um, it could be that you're facing a, a child who's just who's, who's joined the military and now they're being sent to... Afghanistan or, or, or Iraq or, or whatever, you're facing some unknown about the future. As Paul said, maybe you got your pink slip and so you're facing unemployment for the first time in a long, long, long time. You know, the downturn of the economy, whatever it might be, here's the deal. God is still there. And, and I know it sounds much like the first one, but it's, it's really a little bit different. It's realizing that He is there. He is there to see us through. And if he needs to, he's going to carry us through it. You know, the old poem, and, and maybe, you know, there's times that I hesitate to use some of the older stuff, but then I find out that, like, some of the newer folks don't really know it. And, and so it's an old poem, but man, it does it, the impact that it has, the old poem of footprints, of how, how our lives, our, our journey is like walking along a beach or walking along a road with God. And He is very much there. We can see His presence. We can feel His presence. And, and, and then things get rough. Things begin to be a little stormy and trials come. And, and it's almost like we look back and, and we only see our own footprints. We're the only ones who are traveling this path. And, and any of you who have ever suffered in that way, you know that that's true. That you begin to think to yourself, I'm the only one who's ever been through this. No one else knows how I feel. And what we don't quite realize, it's at that point that God steps in and He says, I'm going to see you through this. And if I have to, I'll pick you up and I will carry you through it. But you will not be alone. His promise is that He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And whenever it feels like we're alone, it's whenever he has his arms around us and he is taking us through that valley. Last night as we were out at uh, Betty and Doris's, we kind of had this little circle of chairs now uh, along, you know, just kind of a grassy area. And, and Riker, uh, Riker's just getting used to wearing shoes, okay? And, and they're, they're kind of like little boots, now, I don't know about you, but I, I wear kind of like loafers most of the time. And if I put a pair of work boots on, man, they feel like cement blocks. So imagine that for a, for a little baby. He's used to going barefoot or sock footed, and we got these little boots on him. And he's trying to stand up in the grass. And he keeps standing up, and he falls down. And he keeps standing up. He'll take three or four steps, and he'll fall down. And it keeps going and to the point where uh, every once in a while, I mean, he just keep getting back up. But every once in a while, you'd see this look on his face like, <laughs> you'd, see, you'd see grandpa coming out in him where he's really frustrated 
almost ready to cry, but then he'd get back up again. Now, every once in a while, what would happen is mom or dad or grandma or grandpa or one of the others was sitting around. We would actually get up and help him get up. We'd stand him on his feet. Or, or we'd, we'd help him make sure he got across to where he was going. Folks, what I want you to understand is exactly what God does. He picks you up. He'll pick you up and he'll dust your butt off. And he sets you right back on your path again. And if he sees that you're stumbling, if he sees that you're struggling, sometimes he'll just pick you up and he'll carry you. Especially in those times. We need to realize God's presence. There is a river. We talked about that last week. There's a river. And as followers of Jesus Christ, there is a movement of God. There is a flow of the Holy Spirit. And as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, we're in that river. And God is there as well. We're not alone. And so we realize God's presence. Thirdly, thirdly, he says that we need to learn to accept the consequences and the circumstances of the trial. The way he puts it is verses 2 and 3. He says, therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way. See, the circumstances may be that the earth actually gives way. Um, the mountains may be moved into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, whatever the circumstances or consequences, we still hang on. We still trust. And, 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 and folks, honestly, I think that that's, that's what gets to a lot of people. Is, is they don't they don't hold on. They don't accept the consequences. They don't accept the circumstances. You know, after 9-11, uh, as I've already mentioned, our nation changed, our world changed. If you travel, you know how much it's changed. All the controversy over the last couple of years about whether or not they should be able to x-ray your body as you go through, how that's an invasion of privacy. I was traveling a few months after 9-11. I went over to Indianapolis and got on a plane. And you guys, if you fly, you know this routine, right? Now, I'm not going to take my belt off because I'm, I'm losing weight at such a high rate. I'm afraid my pants might fall down. I'm kidding. But you guys know this routine, and I didn't know I had a hole in this sock. Um, you know that routine. And, and, and what happened was I was actually in, behind a businessman who just started throwing a fit about having to take his shoes off and having to take his belt off and that sort of thing. And, 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 and you know, what he done, you know, I just wanted to step in, and I thought to myself, this guy has got to travel I mean, he looks like he travels all the time. You would think that he would be prepared for this. This is a circumstance, a consequence of the world that we're living in right now. And quite frankly, I'm glad that they do it. In fact, I don't think they target enough people. Racial profiling, religious profiling. Knock yourselves out, do it. I don't care. If you don't have anything to hide, then why should you fear it? I mean, you, you really want to complain? Get on LL Airlines, the Israeli Airlines. I had that uh, experience a few years ago. Flew Israeli Airlines to, uh, to um, uh, Tel Aviv. And I mean, they will put you through the ringer. That's what I wanted to tell this guy. Is, you know, shut, what I wanted to say is, shut up. Somebody ought to punch you in the nose. <laughs> Not me, I'm a preacher. <laughs> but somebody ought to. It's the consequence, it's the circumstances of, of what we're facing. Um, and, and honestly, sometimes we just don't like the consequences. Um, but, but he says that there are consequences. Uh, and, and sometimes it's the consequence of what we've done. And we have to suffer that. You may be learning to regain someone's I mean, to regain someone's trust or, or maybe regaining their love. Maybe we've hurt them in such a way that we've got to apologize and we've got to set things right. And we have to be willing to do that. Listen, the reason that David 
If you know King David's life, the reason that the writer of Hebrews says that he was a man after God's own heart is simply because when the circumstances were before him, when the consequences were before him, he accepted them. He says to Nathan, that man needs to pay four times as much. And Nathan said, David, you are that man. And you don't see David throwing up his hands and going, well, yeah, but, you know, she and he and these people, they could have stopped me. And they no, David just basically says, so be it. And he accepts the consequences. And folks, quite honestly, one of the, the ways that we deal with dark times, with troubled times, is just simply to accept the consequences. I have learned to accept that there will be days for me that look very dark. There will be days for me that are very lonely and difficult. And on those days, Satan will stand and he will whisper and he will say things like, you're not worth very much. You want to know what I do? I look at Satan and I say, now sometimes I look at him and I say, you're a liar. But sometimes he uses the truth against us. He may use that sin that, that you hurt someone else with. He may use that. And you know what you got to do? You got to look at him and this is what you got to say. You know what? You are right. I am a jerk. I am a heel. But I already know that and so do, so do my God. And he has forgiven me. So shut up. We have to face the consequences sometimes. Fourthly, fourthly, the psalmist states that we need to, to understand that God alone brings peace healing and forgiveness. I run into this all the time. Um, people will come to me and they will make this statement. Well, they just won't forgive me. Well, here's what I've realized. You can't make anyone forgive you. You can't do it under your own power. You can't. You just, you just can't. And so accept the fact that only God can bring true peace and healing and forgiveness. And so the best thing that you can do for that person that's not forgiving you or not letting go or whatever it might be is to pray for them because God and God alone is the one who can act in their lives if they will allow them to. And so you just love them anyway. In in verse 6, he says the nations rage, the kingdoms uh, totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. And then skip over to verse 8 and 9. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the, the, the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. And, and what the psalmist is reminding us of is God's sovereignty. If you know the Old Testament well, you know how God throughout the Old Testament um, interacted with people. He said that he would raise up and use who he would use. And it wasn't always Israel. Probably one of the most famous examples is Nebuchadnezzar from ba the nation of Babylon. He raises Nebuchadnezzar up and even makes a statement that he's going to. I'm going to use Nebuchadnezzar to punish Judah. And yet in the midst of this punishment, he also protects them. And he uses Nebuchadnezzar for the same thing. See, it's God who sets things. It's God who sets things right. He is the one who brings peace. He is the one who brings healing. And so we must put our focus back on him. Not on our own efforts. Not on how much we can do. Not on how much we can give. It's, it's upon what God will do with what we have and who we are. And so we must understand that God alone brings peace, healing, and forgiveness. And then finally, verse 10, we must be a people who truly worship our Creator. I think he's kind of sandwiched it that way. Verse 10, he says, he says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And, and don't miss the fact that when 
when the writer of the psalm begins, that's exactly what he does. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. He gives praise to the one who is worthy of our praise. And he brings us full circle. We get our focus on him. And we keep our focus on him by worshiping, by worshiping him. The Apostle Paul, oh, by the way, and, and I hope that you experienced that this morning because that's kind of how we tried to structure the service. We wanted you to, to focus, to focus on God right from the very beginning. It's the reason we used the song that we did, Get Your Eyes on Him. I lift my hands to Him. Our faith will rise, our praise will rise to Him. And then we had a time of communion where we got to commune with God and, and see Him, be with Him, to come into His presence, and then together we worshiped Him. That, that, that was the plan for this morning's Service is to simply experience what Psalm 46 points out. Is that we shift our focus to Him and we worship Him with everything that we have. That's the way we survive dark times. That's the way we get through trouble and trial. I, I love the words there though in verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. You know, I love, I love to sing, don't always do it. I really don't always do it well. Um, sometimes pull it off. But, but the point is that when I sing and I worship God, when you sing, when you worship God, there, there is a connection that you're making that is unlike any other time. The Apostle Paul, in the book of Philippians, puts it this way. He says that there's a day that's coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so there's a day coming, and, and, and some people are of the opinion that what, what that means is that eventually God's going to win out. He, he's going he's gonna to win through to some of those stubborn people, and they're going to want to worship Him. They're going to want to bow down. And, and, and I don't think that's what Paul's writing about at all. I think he's saying there's a day that's coming, that great day of judgment, when we're going to be before God. And we can't help but fall on our faces. And there are going to be people there beside us. And some people say, oh, I can't believe you're naming names, but I'm going to name names. There will be people there like Larry King who doesn't acknowledge Jesus Christ here. There will be people there like Bill Maurer. I know, Bill. Some people like to really listen to him. I get a kick out of that guy. I don't. I think he's arrogant. And he's as lost as lost can be. And if he doesn't change his way, there's a day. There's a day. He can either choose to change his way and he can worship Jesus right here, right now like we do. Or there will be a day when he can't help but fall to his knees. And state that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And so today... We get to make that choice. And I know most people in here are believers. You are followers of Jesus Christ. But honestly, folks, every day we choose who we will worship by the decisions that we make and the choices that we make. And I want to make sure, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm leading you, encouraging you, challenging you to make the right decision and choice. And that's to live for him. See, we exalt Him when we follow Him. We exalt Him when we obey Him. And so that's the decision that's before us this morning. Will we obey? Will we trust Him enough to take the steps that He is leading in each of our hearts? And only you and He, only you and the Holy Spirit know what those steps are. 
And so may he have his lead as we stand together and as we enter this world. <clears throat>